But thus far it's a tie, so thus far we'll leave it and keep it how it is. Uh, talking to Peter, he wants to join as soon as Lodge is over. <laughs> Kick him. That's what I, that's what I said. <laughs> Tell him Logic's over. He's Tell him we started preset period. He's like, I've done logic before and I don't want to do it again, so as soon as you're done, let me know and I'll come do a new set theory. Okay, tell him where the foundations of set theory. Is it because he doesn't like it? Or he thinks he's, he's done it. Um, he did, did he do the first one that we did? He did. Oh. Um, well, he didn't learn. Yeah, tell him we're doing pre set theory. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, let's jump into the material. So, for the last couple classes, we did a deep dive into two axiomatic systems. Big picture, what we did before that is we were talking about how to do general proofs and proofs with the universal quantifier. So we did proofs with the universal quantifier. That was 4.1. Then we did two deep dives into just example problems. Now we're going to 4.2, which is going to be on interpretation and validity. And then 4.3 is going to be doing proofs with the existential quantifier. And this is sandwiched in between because there's some worthwhile discussion before we get to the existential quantifier. And this is going to be a bunch of the same concepts that we already talked about in chapter 3. Chapter 3, we already had a lot to say about... Here we're going to talk about universally valid. This is going to be almost the same thing we meant in chapter 3 by tautology. Uh, here we're going to talk about a formula being consistent. It's going to be almost the same thing that we meant by consistent in chapter 3. We're going to talk about... Uh, uh, what's the other thing that we're going to mention? Proving premises are consistent. Oh, how we talk about an argument being invalid. This is going to be almost identical to how we did in chapter 3. It's just in chapter 3, remember that when we were doing our analysis of arguments, we were just using letters to represent... Uh, atomic sentences as intentional connective. So we were looking at something like A and B. These were the types of things we were looking at. Where A was some atomic sentence, B was some atomic sentence, and then sentential connectives. And that was all the structure we were looking at. And so we had a notion of a tautology, something like this. A or not A. This is what we call the tautology, something that's always true. And it's always true when we only look at its sentential connectives. Notice that the only structure we've captured here are the sentential connectives. So what we meant by tautology up till now is, all, all we really cared about up till now is, if just by looking at the sentential connectives, something is always true, then it's a tautology. But we were only looking at the sentential connectives. Now we're gonna look at the, its entire structure and see when it's always true. So if, if the sentential connectives alone make it always true, then it's always true. But maybe just looking at the sentential connectives alone don't make it always true, and the rest of the structure is what makes it true. So now we're gonna be doing that same analysis, introducing all the structure rather than this very crude structure. So remember the sentence I gave you when we were explaining the structure was, everything is red or not red. For every object, it is either red or not red. Now, from a, if we were just using sentential connectives and atomic sentences, that's an atomic sentence. The only way we could represent that is with some letter R. We can't represent that as R or not R, because that's saying everything's red or not everything's red, which isn't what we're saying. We're saying the sentence, everything, every object is either red or not red. If we were only looking at sentential connectives, the best we could do is just represent that with one symbol like that, R. And is our tautology? No, it can be true or false. But now when we break it down and we look at its entire structure, we said the way that we structure that sentence is for all x, red applies to x or not red applies to x. And now when we break it down and we look at all its structure, we realize, okay, now that is a tautology. Or not a tautology, that's not what we're going to call it now. Now we're going to call it universally valid. So we're going to do exactly what we did in chapter 3 all over again. But this time we're looking at the entire structure rather than just the sentential connectors. So would we still call that a tautology? Or no, we'd call that universally valid. Tautology only applies without quantifiers. 
Tautology applies when it's just looking at the sentential connectors. So when you're looking at A or not A, that's a tautology. Where A here is some proposition, true or false, true or false. Here, R represented a predicate. So maybe use alpha and beta for propositions. Alpha or not alpha. That's a tautology. It's something that's always true just based off the sentential connectors. Alpha is something that's true or false, and no matter what it is, this whole thing is true or this whole thing is true. Could you remind me what a sentential connector is? I know it's very common. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's recap on our grammar. Recap on our grammar. Five basic components to our grammar. Every symbol we write will fall into one of these five categories. It will either be a sentential connective. What are sentential connectives? There's only five of them that we really care about in this class. And or not implies logically equivalent. There are Boolean operators. Okay, parentheses. We all know what parentheses are. Uh, our terms. Our terms are variables, constants, or combinations of variables and constants using operators. Three plus two. Three by itself, a term. Two by itself, a term. Three plus two, a term. X, a term. Two times x, a term. Will you remind me what a constant looks like in terms of logical notation compared to numbers? Okay. As a general rule, that's a good point. Let, let's write symbols next to all these. So here we have not and or implies and logically equivalent. That's our notation there. Parentheses are just parentheses. Uh, for terms, our variables. We use the letters X, Y, and Z typically, letters at the end of the alphabet to represent variables. Our constants, we typically use A, B, and C, letters at the start of the alphabet. And our operators, that will depend on the domain. Uh, plus is a common one that we use generically. Uh, prime is a common one that we use generically. Uh, circle is a common one that we use generically. What was, what was our formal definition? An operator is something that takes terms and spits out terms. Is it, wasn't it like, a, isn't it defined in like the terms of a function? Uh, <laughs> That's a different thing. I think it's a different thing. You can give it a functional definition. Okay. So there's going to be rollover of things that we talk about. For example, here, we talk, moving on to the next one, predicates. We represent predicates with capital letters. So something like the capital letter P, or up here I use R, or whatever makes sense based off the context. Now one way that you can think about a predicate is it's a Boolean valued function. You give it a term, or the appropriate number of terms, and it spits out a Boolean, true or false. Okay. So a predicate that takes two terms have a special name, we call that a relation. Now you know that there's a set theoretical definition of a relation. The set theoretical definition of a relation is a relation in the logical sense. In the logical sense, here's all relations. The set theoretical ones are right there. And so you can have a rollover of notions like that. So uh, just to make sure I have this clear, variables are an arbitrary number of a set and constants are a specific number? We haven't talked about members of sets yet. Okay. We'll be introducing domain right here. Okay. But yes. A variable stand in for any value. A constant is a particular value. Okay. Uh, the way that we come at it... Your values are in context of something, usually. Yes. When you, when you give it a definition, it's... Up till now, we've been saying... We're going to assume from context what the domain of individuals is that we're talking about. Gotcha. Okay. So predicates, we usually use capital letters to represent predicates. The is red predicate, we represent it with capital R. In general, if I just say some general predicate, I'll usually represent it with capital P. And then finally, our quantifiers, we have two quantifiers. We have the universal quantifier, the upside down A, the for all quantifier, and then the existential quantifier, the there exists quantifier. And those are our two quantifiers. So when we write some statement like this, every single one of these symbols has to fall into one of these five categories. Every time we break down some sentence into its logical structure, every symbol will be one of these five things. Is the one and the only one quantifier um, separate from there exists, or is it just like a oh, subset? Uh, you can define the there exists one and only one in terms of these. Okay. 
So we could define that quantifier if we found it useful. All right. All right. So there's a reminder of what we've been doing. So before we were doing an analysis where we just cared about the sentential connectives, now we're going to look at the entire structure, sentential connectives, terms, predicates, and quantifiers, and see what we can determine about these things. When they're consistent, when they're inconsistent, when, the, when an argument's valid, et cetera. So the x is a term in this. x, y, and z, variables are terms. Constants, a, b, and c, one, two, three, those are terms. I'm talking about Parley, Levi. For all x, constants, um, terms. R, x, or not R, x. The x in that case is oh, considered a term. Perfect, yes. We'll go over. Parenthesis, universe quantifier. Term, parenthesis, parenthesis, predicate, term. Sentential connective, sentential connective, predicate, term, parenthesis. Good. All right. So now let's jump into this section. We're no longer talking about sentential interpretation, where we're doing interpretations where we only preserve the sentential connectives. Now we're going to talk about interpretation in general, where we preserve all the structure. OK? So let's get to the definition now of interpretation. Sentence P, now remember what the author means by sentence. A formula that is true or false. And a formula is a collection of autonomous sentences and sentential connectors. And these other things. Okay. But yeah, this is the formula right here. But this is also a formula. Uh, R applying to X implies W applies to X. Okay, there's a formula. That is not a sentence. Because we can't call it true or false. Let me, let me be more concrete. One that's obviously not a sentence to you. X is greater than two. Okay. Term, predicate, constant. Or sorry, variable, predicate, constant. This is a formula. True or false, X is greater than two. Bad question. It's not a proposition, or it's not what the author calls a sentence. It's not something that's true or false. It's just a formula. We can add the existential quantifier. We can say something like there exists an x such that x is greater than 2. OK, now it's a sentence, and it happens to be a true sentence. Or I can say for all x, x is greater than 2. Also a sentence, a false sentence, but a sentence. So a sentence has to be true or false. So I have to come to some type of conclusion. You have to be able to determine whether it's true or false. It has to make sense to answer that question. It can't just be a predicate. If we just left it like this, that's just a predicate. X greater than two, true or false? That's a predicate. You need to give me the term you're talking about in order for me to answer the question. Okay, so there's right here a formula. A sentence is a formula that's either true or false. This is not a sentence. This is just a formula. A sentence P is an interpretation of a formula Q with respect to the domain of individuals D. That's the first time we mentioned that. So what this means is from here on out, when we create an interpretation, we're going to need to start stating what our domain is. What set of objects are we talking about? When I say, coming back up here, when I say for all x, x is greater than 2, my domain now is the set of all numbers. Typically, we could guess from context what the domain is. But now it's our interpretation. We need to specify our domain. All right. So P is an interpretation of a formula Q with respect to the domain of individuals D, if and only if P can be obtained from Q by substituting predicates and operator symbols defined on D for predicates and operate, operation symbols of Q, respectively. Respectively meaning you have to replace predicates with predicates and operators with operators. You can't crisscross. Doesn't make sense. And by substituting constants in D for constants and free variables in Q. Okay, that sounds like a mouthful. It sounds like it could be really confusing, but pretty simple, actually. Not worth getting that chair. So let's go back to our example and then create interpretations of these, which we have already been doing. We've already been doing this process. So going back to that first system we worked with. That first system we worked with, we had these two axioms and these two definitions. So our first axiom was, for all x, for all y, and for all z, 
if we have xqy and yqz, then we have xqz. In other, whatever, in other words, whatever q is, it's transitive, for those of you who remember those properties. Now our second axiom was for all x and for all y, we either have xqy or yqx. Those were our two axioms. Now we said we can come up with interpretations for what these things mean. Strictly speaking, what do these things mean? Just what's written. That's what they mean. But we come up with interpretations to help us reason about it and help us think about it. So one interpretation we came up with for this is, oh, we can think about the Q as being like less than or equals, where the X, Y, and Z here are numbers. So we can think about, let's think about our domain as being, this is just a fancy symbol for the numbers. Our domain is going to be the numbers, the real numbers. If you don't know what a real number is, it's just a number. And now, and we'll think about Q as being the less than or equals. So notice that less than or equals is a predicate defined on the real numbers. So we are substituting a predicate defined on the real numbers, a predicate defined on D, for a predicate in Q. So shoot, we have two Qs here. Uh, hopefully I don't confuse you. This line right here is the Q being talked about up here. And this line right here is going to be the P that this talks about up here. Okay, so let's come up with our interpretation. Our interpretation was we're saying that for all X and for all Y and for all Z, we have X is less than or equal to Y if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to z, then x is less than or equal to z. That was our interpretation of that statement. Where our d, stick our d up here in case we forgot, d is a set of all numbers, all real numbers. So notice this right here is a sentence. We don't have any free variables. X is bounded by that quantifier, Y is bounded by that quantifier, Z is bounded by that quantifier. So this is something that is true or false. We can call this true or false. So this is a sentence. So sentence P is an interpretation of sentence Q with respect to the domain of individuals D. We said our domain is all real numbers. The individuals D, if and only if, P can be obtained from Q by substituting Predicates defined on D and operators. We didn't have any operators here, so that's not applicable. But predicates defined on D, less than or equals, is defined on real numbers for predicates in Q. Defined on D for predicates of Q, respectively, and by substituting constants in D for constants and free variables in Q. Okay, that one wasn't applicable. Here to here, so far, we just did a substitution Predicates for predicates. And it worked. Now, what was our interpretation for this one? Almost identical. When we created an interpretation for this sentence, it was just for all x and for all y, x less than or equal to y, or y is less than or equal to x. This was our interpretation of that statement. Going on to our interpretation of this definition, our interpretation was for all x, for all y, x equals to y. We define that to mean x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x. Again, we replace a predicate defined on here, a predicate in here, for a predicate defined on our domain. Equals is de a defined predicate on the set of real numbers. We replace a predicate in this statement. This is our Q, talked about in this definition. A predicate in Q for a predicate defined on D, the real numbers. Valid interpretation. And similarly, we have our interpretation for this. For all X and for all Y, we define X is less than Y. 
to b, it is not the case that y is less than or equal to x. And that was our interpretation of that sentence. So there's a taste of it so far. So far, we were only replacing predicates with predicates in our interpretation and setting our domain. Let's do another one now. Um, oh, go ahead. It says x is less than y is, uh, is um, equivalent to, uh, it's not the case that y is less than or equal to x. Um, yeah. If Levi is not taller than you or the same height as you, Levi must be shorter than you. Oh, for some reason in my mind, the X and the Y were in the same spot, but that, okay, they're close. No, that makes perfect sense now. Okay. All right, so now let's look at this one, and let's come up with an interpretation of this statement. Trying to follow some of the same notation that we were just using in the previous one. Let's make our domain all real numbers. So coming up with the interpretation of what this is saying right here. I'm going to pick my domain to be all real numbers, and I'm going to say that this is saying... If x is less than y, then for all z, if x is equal to z, then z is less than y. Perfectly valid interpretation, right? So I'm going to set d here. d is going to be all real numbers for an interpretation of this now. This is our q. And my interpretation is going to be x less than y implies for all z, if z x is equal to z, then z is less than y. Right? This is an interpretation of that. Everyone follow that? Question, is this true or false? It's true. This one's a little bit of a gotcha because of how I said it out loud. X less than Y, is that true or false? Well, if X is less than Y. The yeah, that's the way I phrased it, as though this were true. a sentence, something that we can determine to be true or false. Right. We can't determine that to be true or false. That's a less than relation. That's all that is. So it's just a formula. So this is just a formula. This is not an interpretation. So let's read through this again and see why this is not an interpretation. I cheated. Sentence P, already that's not a sentence, but here's our P, here's our Q. P, Q. A sentence P is an interpretation of sentence Q with respect to the domain of individuals D, if and only if P can be obtained from Q by substituting predicates and operation symbols defined on D for predicates and operation symbols defined on Q respectively. So we did that. That we did validly. Those were what we had in Q. That's what we had in P. And it made sense for our domain of individuals, but then we had the second part. And by substituting constants in D for constants and free variables in Q. These are free variables in Q. We have to replace them with members of our domain here for it to work. So I need to pick something to be my X and my Y. Is that implication still true though, regardless? You're used to saying it is because idiomatically speaking, we plug in existential quantifiers. When you see something like this, you want to say true x plus y equals y plus x because we're lazy that's a point. but we're really saying for all x and for all y x plus y equals y plus x so that's not so this isn't something you could just call true hmm. seems weird because we're very comfortable calling that true but it's understood from context what we're saying okay so if we had said for all x and for all y then that would be a true statement we could add a for x and for all y in front of the whole thing that would be true. Or, and that would be a true interpretation. That's the only difference. Oh, sorry. That would be true. It would not be a true interpretation, though, because now we added structure. Right. We can, all we get to do is if, replace predicates. If you add it above there. With, if we had it above there, okay. yes. So, but we can't just add it down here and call it an interpretation, because well, then we're adding structure that wasn't there before. And notice that nowhere here doesn't allow us to do anything with the quantifiers. Then is there a case? And so if you, so let me just finish real quick. Two, three. Okay. If z is equal to two, then z is less than three. Here's a valid interpretation. Yeah. That makes sense. So I replace my free variables with constants. with constants from my domain. 
So let's read through it one more time, and hopefully this definition has now synced in. So one more time. A sentence P is an interpretation of a formula Q with respect to some domain of individuals D, in this case it is all real numbers, if and only if P can be obtained from Q by substituting predicates and operation symbols defined on D, so in that case we replace the I and the P with the equals in the lesson, substituting predicates and operation symbols defined on D for predicates and operation symbols of Q respectively. So that's what we did in replacing the I with the equals, the P with the lesson. And by substituting constants in D for constants and free variables in Q. And so we had to replace those free variables with constants in order for it to be an interpretation. So there's the big gotcha. Remember, you have to replace your free variables. And it can sound funny in the way I worded it. It sounded perfectly true. Can you remind me of the difference between a free variable and a variable? A free variable is one that is not bounded by some quantifier. Okay. All right. That's, so that's this right. x and this y are free because no quantifier is bounding them. The z over here is not a free variable. It's bounded by that quantifier. Down here, none of them were free. Down here, none of them were free. Correct. All right. Let's do another one. An interpretation of this. For all x and for all y, x plus y equals y plus x. Well, we can pick our domain of individuals to be the real numbers. We could replace our plus with times and then keep everything else the same. In other words, you don't have to get radically different in your interpretation if you don't want to. x times y is equal, let's swap our y's and x's just to switch up a little. I can plug in the y for the x, the x for the y, and the times for the plus, and keep the equals the same. There's another interpretation. Really similar to the interpretation we already had. It doesn't have to be radically different, like it was between here and here. Just interpretation. All right. Let's try one more. Here we'll just replace the plus with times. So we'll say that, and we'll say that our domain of individuals is all real numbers. So we'll say there exists a y such that x times y is greater than x. And that could be our interpretation. It's perfectly valid, right? No. No. Because you don't have a quantifier for x. Because x is a free variable. So if we just add the for all x, now it's an interpretation. There we go, right? Well, they say you can if you add it above. Oh, no, we can't do that either. Nowhere over here does it say stick quantifiers where you feel like it. Yeah, that's not the same story. Not a valid thing to do. All we can do is replace operators with operators, predicates with predicates, and free variables with constants. Free variables and constants with Free variables and constants. So just or with constants, constants I mean. Random so we have to pick a constant for x. Yeah. And so we can say there exists a y such that 2 times y is greater than 2. Okay, now we're good. Let me switch it up one more time. Let's say our initial statement was this there exists a y such that x plus y is greater than 1. I could have replaced that constant with the new constant and put 57 here, and it's still an interpretation. I replace constants and free variables with constants in my domain. Even though it ends up being false, even with the two... Kind We're of not guaranteed that if this was true, this is going to be true. Right. This doesn't preserve truthality, <laughs> truthfulness. <laughs> it's just interpretation. It's going to turn out something that is true or false. It's okay if your interpretation comes out false. doesn't mean it's not an interpretation. Now, in this case, it still happens to be true. It doesn't matter what number I put there. I can always find a y big enough such that 2y is bigger than it. My y could be 30, for example. So, it happens to still be true. Uh, is there really only two quantifiers, roughly? <laughs> there is only two quantifiers. That is weird. <laughs> and in fact... You can define your existential quantifier. If you go back to when I first introduced that, I gave you the definition. 
of an existential quantifier. And it's actually defined in terms of the universal quantifier. So you only really need the universal quantifier. The existential quantifier is just a restatement of the universal quantifier. Hmm. Fascinating. Saying that all ducks are white is the same thing as saying it is not the case that there exists a duck that is not white. And so I can always state a universal quantifier in terms of an existential. And I can go the other way. Did I say it weird? Saying all ducks are white is the same thing as saying it is not the case that there exists a non-white duck. There does not exist a duck that is not white is the same thing as saying all ducks are white. Hopefully said right. So we could define more quantifiers if we want. Another one that Levi mentioned was the, the uniqueness quantifier which is existential with an explanation point after it. And that means there exists one and only one. But again, we can define this in terms of these two symbols. You can't say there's two and only two or something like that? Like, how you... We don't have a symbol for it. If that's really useful to you for some reason, you can make up your symbol and just give it a definition that says that exact thing. Um, is there a way to break it down into universal quantifiers? Or is it the two quantifiers there? Is there a way to rewrite this in terms of these? No, in, in, from my statement, there exists two and only two. There's a way to write that. I don't know off the top of my head. But Writing things it. out completely in logic gets messy, but... You can break it down into the quantifiers which exist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you really only need this one, and it's just a matter of what's useful. Turns out the existential is extremely useful. And so we decide to define that. I, I can also see where you could actually even take the uh, exists and break it down into every... Uh, you can go both ways. Oh. It's just that it's easy for us to tell you when a universal statement is true. It's harder with an existential. When is a universal statement true? When it's true regardless of what the term is. And I gave you that definition last time when I introduced that as well. But that's kind of dense for a first time through going through all this material. The second time is more when you start catching and making all those connections. Okay. Here's why I give it for those of you who have done this before, like Peter, back at home. I was pointing at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we did that. That's interpretation. Okay. So that was interpretation. We're done talking about sentential interpretations, and now we're talking about interpretation. We're not just preserving the sentential connectives anymore. We're preserving all the structure. We're preserving the quantifiers, the predicates, and the operators in our interpretations. That's a big difference, though. Is that not what you were doing before? Going back to previous chapters, when we do a sentential interpretation of a sentence, we only preserve the sentential connectives. And that's all we preserved. But what we just barely did. What we just barely did, interpretation in general, was preserving all the structure. So this is a more general notion of interpretation. More restricting, more structure capturing. Okay, so now we're gonna give our equivalent to a tautology. We talked about tautologies when the sentential connectives alone made the statement always true. Now we're gonna talk about being universally valid. A formula is universally valid if every interpretation of it on every non-empty domain is true. Kind of ignore the non-empty domain for a second. But if every interpretation of it on every domain is true, it's universally valid. That's what it means to be universally valid. No matter how you interpret it, it's true. That's what we mean by universally valid. And valid arguments are going to be these universally valid things. The fact that axiom one and axiom two implies some theorem, what we were doing before, when we show that this axiom and this axiom together implied some statement, whatever we proved, if we look at that argument as a whole, it would have been universally valid. No matter what interpretation you would have come up with, it would have worked. Why does the domain have to be non-empty? We'll get to non-empty domain in a second. But for now, everything but the non-empty I want you to have good intuition for. It's true under every interpretation, it's universally valid. That's what we mean. And just try and capture some confusion that might come up from that. 
So I told you last time we did something of the form. We said axiom one and axiom two imply maybe theorem three depended on both axiom one and axiom two. And we proved this last time, or the time before. When and I'm saying this, this exact axiom one, axiom two right here. You go back and you look at the third thing we proved, pretending that it depended on both axioms. Then what we showed is that this and this together imply theorem three. And we've proved that this was true. That's what our derivation was. You with me so far? So what we mean by universally valid, a proof is stating that this thing is universally valid. What we're saying is now any interpretation of that thing will be true, no matter how you interpret it. Because one of two things is going to happen. If you interpret it such that your axioms are true, then the theorem is going to fall from your axioms. If you interpret it such that your axioms are false, a false antecedent is always a true implication. The implication becomes vacuously true. So if you give it any interpretation that made the axioms true, the theorem was true. If you gave it an interpretation that made the axioms false, this thing was still universally valid. Now it's vacuously true. That's why we care about universally valid. That's what we're doing when we prove something. We're proving it's universally valid. We're showing some implication like this. It can't be false. No matter how you interpret it, it's always true. Rather than just showing it was a tautology, which is what we did prior to that. If it's a tautology, it's universally valid. So everything that we show is a tautology, we automatically adopt. It means it's universally valid just by looking at sentential connectors. We can ignore all the other structure. So when those axioms have no free variables? An axiom will never have a free variable. That's OK. So I don't think. If that's the case, then that is a universally valid function. What you have here, A1 and A2 implies T3. Yeah. Right. I'm saying when we went back to the system with this yeah. axiom, this axiom, and these definitions. I'm just clarifying that that is a universally valid formula. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, I'm saying that this is an instance where we care about universally valid. It's going to be for our proofs. We want our proofs to be universally valid. That's what it means to prove something, to demonstrate it's universally valid. Proof. OK. So that's why we make much ado about universally valid. All right, next concept. Our next concept was a concept of consistency. Our premises being consistent. Try to give you an intuition for, uh, I don't know, kids getting a fight. You talk to kid A, they said, I hit him because they took my toy first. Kid B says, no, they took my toy and so I hit him. I don't think I said two different things. <laughs> kid A says, they took my toy so I hit him. Kid B says, no, they hit me, so I took their toy. Okay, those are inconsistent premises. One of the kids has to be lying. On the other hand, if kid A says, I hit him because he took my toy, and kid B says, I took his toy because he called me dumb, now those are consistent. They could still be lying. It doesn't make what they're saying true, but it's possible for what they're saying to be true. Maybe both kids are lying. And they're making up stuff for whatever reason. So consistent just means it's possible for both the statements to be true, or all the statements to be true. If they give you some big list of statements, you're trying to figure out what happened, you're taking their statements that they give you as your premises to logic about what happened, reason about what happened. Okay, so a formula, typically the formula we care about is this fancy P. What's this fancy P? It reminds me of partitions, but it's probably not what it is. Not that. This fancy P stands for the conjunction of all our premises. If you have 10 premises, and this is premise one and premise two and premise three and premise four, the conjunction of all your premises. Typically, that's what we care about. Are all our premises together consistent? Is it possible for all of them to be true? So that's typically when we care about consistency. So a formula, typically the conjunction of all our premises is the formula we care about. A formula is consistent if and only if it has at least one true interpretation on some non-empty domain. If it's possible for all the premises to be true, in other words, then they're consistent. Almost the exact same concept we've had for consistency before. OK. Now, why all this non-empty domain business? Intuitively, we're not very interested in reasoning on empty sets. What can you say about nothing 
isn't something we care too much about. So there's the intuition for it. More concretely is there's going to be two pieces of reasoning. They're basically the same piece of reasoning, but we'll say two pieces of reasoning that we're going to want to be able to use. The first one that we're going to want to be able to use is that if for all x, something's true about x, then there exists an x such that something's true about x. If I'm going to say that every natural number is greater than, z greater than or equal to zero, I want to be able to conclude there exists a natural number greater than or equal to zero. If I want to say everyone wears a hat, I want to say there exists someone that wears a hat. So you're, to clarify, you're saying that, that having that quality is useful, but not necessary, but that must be the case for all. We're not saying that this must be the case. Okay. We're saying if we limit ourselves to a non-empty domain, so we're not talking about no one, and we're always talking about something. Then it's always a case that if it's true for everything in the domain, then there must be at least one thing that's true for it, since we're never talking about an empty set of objects. So if it's true for everything, it's true for something. We want that to always be a piece of reasoning that we can use. We can only always use that piece of reasoning if our domain is never empty. If our domain is empty, then this does not follow since there doesn't exist anything. Does that make sense? And then the other one's pretty similar to it. We want these two statements to be contradictions. We want the fact that it's always the case that h of x occurs to contradict the fact that there does not exist something where h of x occurs. h of x never occurs should contradict, it always occurs. Yeah, contradict symbol for me. Oh, sorry. It's common notation when you do proof. That's not something from this class. That's something that's just we use in general. It's not something that's author introduces. Oh. I just write a lot. <laughs> contradict it. Um, what would be the opposite of a contradiction? Of a contradiction? Yes. No. Uh, the op. If you're going to say an opposite of a contradiction, uh, tautology. A contradiction is something that's always false. A tautology is something that's always true. Okay. In terms of propositional logic. And so it's two arrows pointing at each other. What's the symbol for tautology? Uh, we don't really have one. Okay. Some people come up with a tautology operator, but it's not that useful. On the other hand, pointing out contradiction is very useful often because we do proof by way of contradiction a lot. And so that's typically where you see the symbol. So they start out with, assume by way of contradiction this statement is true, da 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 da, and then they get a contradiction. And then they put this back and forth arrow after it, right after it to say, I'm, I'm telling you that that's where my contradiction was. So it's just something to make clear to the reader. This line is what we were after. And I'll definitely be using a lot more as we go. Okay, so that's why we want non-empty domains. So that we can use these two pieces of reasoning and not have to worry. And then for a less uh, rigorous reason, more intuitive reason, we don't really care about what we can say about nothing. We want to make inferences about something. So never want an empty domain. Okay, next. An argument being invalid. An argument is invalid if and only if there is an interpretation on some non-empty domain that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. When is an argument invalid? An argument is invalid if I can come up with some interpretation that makes the premises true but the conclusion false. My argument says if this is true, then this is true. If I can come up with an interpretation where this is true but this is false, then the argument must be invalid. Give you a simple one. I say if a number is greater than zero, it has to be prime. What do you say? Nine. You say nine. You say nine's a number greater than zero, satisfies my antecedent, it's not prime. That's how you show my argument is false. You show it's invalid. We often call that a counterexample. Counterexample is something that satisfies the antecedent but contradicts the conclusion. 
OK? So that's how we show an argument is invalid. Some interpretation that makes the premises true, but the conclusion false. Because an argument being valid means anytime the premise is true, the conclusion is true. That's what it means for an argument to be valid. So the only way to show invalid doesn't matter when the premises is false, because then the argument's vacuously true. You need the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. That's the only time you get implication to be false. Going all the way back to our truth tables. That's what you're doing. You're trying to show an implication is false. Okay, next. Oh, not next. Conversation now about some of these items. So before, we could check if an argument was valid, going back to when our arguments were just of the form something like alpha and beta or alpha implies beta, something like that. Is this argument true or false? What would we do? We try to come up with an interpretation where this was true, but that was false. That's what we were doing before, going back to chapter three. And our arguments look like this, just sentential connectives. We weren't looking at any other structure. You with me? Now, one way we could have tested this is brute force with the truth table. I could have created a big truth table, plugged in all possible values for alpha and beta, and maybe this had some big expression with alpha, beta, gamma, da 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 da. Maybe it had 86 variables. We could have constructed some massive truth table and then checked in the last column, is it ever false? Because if it was ever possible for it to be false, the argument is not valid. So we used to have this mechanical way of testing if an argument was valid. Just test all possible combinations for true and false. All right. Well, now with our more general notion of interpretation, where we're also preserving operators, predicates, and quantifiers, the question is, can we do something similar? Is there some mechanical way where we could test all the possible values to see if an argument is valid? Maybe if our domain is finite, we could try everything in our domain. But there's no reason our domain has to be finite. What's the, what's the quality that causes the shift? What I'm asking like is, can you do that same thing uh, that you could with sentential connectives if you have predicates? Or when you have predicates, does that break your system and now we can't do anything? Because it seems like you can still do that with predicates, but when you add the quantifiers, is that uh, what changes it? You kind of need to introduce predicates, terms, and quantifiers all together. Because predicates take terms to spit out booleans. Uh -huh. So those two have to come hand in hand. And then predicates by themselves are not uh, things you can call true or false. The greater than two predicate, we might represent like this. The greater than two predicate. Okay, that's a predicate. But if your predicate is a relation, then it works. No. no. So here's the greater than predicate. X is greater than Y. Okay. So there's a greater, there's the greater than predicate. Okay. X is greater than Y. That's not something that's true or false. The only one way, not the only way, one way we can make that true or false is to introduce two quantifiers. I can say for all X and for all Y, X greater than Y. No, it's something that's true or false. So to convert predicates to propositions, you either need to plug in specific terms or you need to add quantifiers. So is it because you have free variables that, that we can no longer do what we used to be able to do? Is it because we have free variables? If all of your variables have bounds by quantifiers. All, all the axioms that we wanted to talk about aren't going to have free variables. And so it's still not the case even when you, I say it's still not the case, I haven't told you what the case is. I see what you're trying, I mean, I see what you're coming to. So the point is we have no mechanical way of testing it anymore. Because I can't just plug in true and falses for all the values anymore. Can you give me an example? I'm not seeing why. Not seeing why. So I need some conclusion. I don't know, anyone remember something we proved? Here's an axiom, here's an axiom. And we proved that they imply, these two together implied something. Okay. Before, I want to say, is this proof a valid proof right here with alpha and beta? Okay. And you know how to test this. 
Yeah. I plug in all the possible truths and falses and see if this whole thing, when I evaluate it, comes out true. And we can mechanically do that. So now I say that this axiom and this axiom together imply some statement, doesn't matter what it is. How do we determine if it's true or false? I can't mechanically just plug in true or falses anymore. Unless you have a finite domain. Is that what we were talking about? I mean, unless we have a finite domain. Well, I can say that this thing always comes out true or false, and I can say this thing always comes out true or false, but then we still have the quantifiers. And we might be able to figure it out in a specific case, but we're not going to have some general formula for how we can come up with these things. So before, it was pretty straight simple. Alpha and beta, true or false, we know how to evaluate that easily. Okay. Here, not so much. Just because this comes out true, and this comes out true, and this comes out true, does that mean that would have always been the case for any x, y, and z? No. Well. And you see how it gets hard to reason about. Yeah. Whereas here, it's trivial. So what we were leading up to is, is there any general procedure that we can, plug, that we can run these things through to test is an argument valid? We know how to do it as long as you're just giving me propositions and sentential connectives. I plug in all the possible true or false values on some big truth table, and we can do it. Is there some general formula? Maybe we just haven't thought about it, but maybe there's a really, really, really clever way. We get a lot of really smart people together in a room for a really long time to really think about it. And then, would they be able to come up with a general formula? And the answer is no. And provably no. That was proved by Alonzo Church, as in worked with Alan Turing. If you remember, we talked about similar con a similar thing in uh, computation theory. I would guess he somehow proved that this is an undecidable problem. If you remember the undecidable set of things, like the halting problem. I don't know his specific proof for this. But no, and that was proven by Alonzo Church, 1936. This is when a lot of the breakthroughs in logic were happening. Around the time. Now, we have another breakthrough in logic by possibly the most famous logician since Aristotle, Kurt Gödel. Does that name ring a bell to anyone? Should show a better name? No. It's a pretty good old name. All right, Kurt Gödel. So, I didn't tell you what complete was. Oh, I stayed right after. Kurt Gödel, now he proved the rules of inference are complete. So, so far we can talk about our rules of inference. What are the rules of inference we have so far? We have rule P. We can introduce a premise at any point. We have rule T. If a line is tautologically implied by the previous lines, we can put it in there. We have the rule of conditional proof, which enables us to remove a premise. We have the rule reductio ad absurdum. We have the rule of universal generalization. And we have the rule of universal specification. Those are our six rules so far. Surprise, we're going to introduce two more rules, existential specification and existential generalization for the existential quantifier. Those are going to be our eight rules. We haven't done existential yet. We'll do that next section. So, Kurt Gödel proved that the rules of inference are complete. What do we mean by complete? He proved that if Q logically follows from P, if Q logically follows from P, then Q can be derived from P. If Q logically follows from P, it is possible for me to construct a proof starting with P and work, 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 and get to Q. And that's a possible thing for me to prove. So it's like a way to narrow down your axioms, kind of, potentially? Not a way to narrow down your axioms. Oh, I see what you're saying. We'll talk about the concrete way to narrow down your axioms. There is a way to do that. But the point is, maybe you think some statement's true. How do you know that you can even prove it? even if it is true. Is some statement true based on my axioms? He proved that the rules of inference are complete for logic. In logic, if, it's poss if it is true, you can prove it. If it is true, you can prove it. Yes. If it is true, you can prove that it's true. Off of a set of axioms? A given set of axioms? Uh, 
No, sorry. His proofs for, how can I say this? His proofs for, your proofs for propositional and first order predicate logic. Your things are just proofs of logic. If it's true, then you can prove it's true. Okay, get to the weird one now. His incompleteness theorem. Here's a weird one. His incompleteness theorem is now for systems of mathematics. In particular, he did with arithmetic. It was shown to generalize to things like geometry, uh, real analysis, uh, whatever. He proved that these systems are incomplete. Like arithmetic. So you're working in arithmetic. It is possible you're trying to prove something in arithmetic. It is possible that the statement you're trying to prove it is true in that system, but there is no proof for it. And it's impossible to prove it. I know, crazy. His incompleteness here. One of the strangest pieces of logic. It's amazing that he proved it. He proved it. You've got some axiom system. He was using the axioms of arithmetic. So we have our axioms of arithmetic. A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. He proved that there is some statement that is true in this system based on these axioms. There is some statement out here that's true, some statement S1, but it is impossible to prove. You can't prove it to be true just by looking at the logical implications of these things using our rules of inference here. Sounds like First statement. His first statement was just for propositional and predicate logic, when you have no axioms, and when you're just proving theorems of logic, and we'll prove some theorems of logic. When there are no axioms, okay. When it's all said and done, it doesn't depend on anything. Something we prove in logic is uh, for all x, uh, p of x or not p of x. That's a theorem of logic. It doesn't matter what your axiomatic system is, this is always true. But when we get to our mathematical systems that we're setting these things up for, it turns out that they're not complete. None of them are complete. So there's true statements that you cannot prove from the axioms. And yet you can know that the statement is true. Which is really weird, because typically the way that we know a statement is true is we say these axioms imply it. That's how we know it's true. Is there an example of this? To wrap your head around his example is not trivial, but it can be done. You don't need to know any crazy in-depth math. It would just be like a 30-minute conversation going over what he did. His incompleteness here. Here's a YouTube video that does it really well. All you need to know to understand his proof is uh, prime factorization. Every number has a unique prime factorization. That's the only complex of math you need to know to understand what he's talking about. And you can watch a YouTube video that would do a great job explaining the incompleteness theorem. We post it in the Facebook group. So he'll post whatever video he's talking about. But it's amazing. So while axiomatic systems are great ways for finding out things are true, it turns out humans are able to determine things are true even outside the axiomatic system. So one of the ways that we're definitely different from like a machine. You know, there's all this nonsense of, oh, AIs are gonna be smarter than humans. No, an AI can only logic about what you give it. An AI could never, from these axioms, determine this is true. Kurt Gödel can. He can go outside the axiomatic system. Human understanding is not limited to axiomatic systems. It's crazy. That is really crazy. It is crazy. It means that there is no axiomatic system that can capture human understanding. That's what he shows in this. Or that we just haven't come up with it's not a matter of, oh, maybe we weren't clever enough with our axiomatic systems. I know. It has no logical implication. Get crazy with these however you want. However you try to prove them, any fancy technique you come up with, it's not their logical implication. And he shows it's not their logical implication. And through showing it's not their logical implication, the statement itself has to be true. It's weird. It's pretty cool. It's very crazy cool concept. Of course, because you have to go outside the system that we use to reason. <laughs> it's amazing.
that human beings are able to do this. So his incompleteness here, it's fascinating. You should try to wrap your head around it at least once. But, I have to mention it, incomplete sir. In logic, our system that we'll be working with will be nice and complete. But we'll get to a system that's not, when we get to step three. Okay, uh, so that was a little bit of a second. General use of interpretation. So this whole section right now, we were on interpretations and how we do interpretation. Why do we really care about interpretations? What are they, in practice, useful for? In practice, interpretations are useful for three things. Proving an argument is invalid. Those of you who have done math, this is the same thing as proof by counterexample. That's what you're doing. A counterexample is an interpretation that makes the premises true and the conclusion follows. It's just in your interpretation, you usually keep almost everything the exact same. Proving an argument is valid. True premises, false conclusion, find a, an interpretation that has that. Another thing that they're useful for is proving premises are consistent. How can we prove premises are consistent? we make the conjunction of all their premises true. It's possible for all the premises to be true, then they're consistent. Remember the kids telling you the story about what happened. In one case, it's impossible for their story to be true. In another case, it is possible. That was uh, consistent versus inconsistent premises. Third useful case is proving that axioms are independent of each other. What do we mean by independent of each other? In a sense, when we're building some axiomatic system, our axioms are our basic assumptions that we start with, right? We don't have a proof for an axiom, it's just our starting points. We want as few starting points as we can possibly have. I don't want 10,000 starting points if I could only have five. That's much easier to reason about. And so, an axiom is independent from the other axioms if it couldn't have been proven from those axioms then it must be giving you new information. For example, if I would have introduced, so here's one of our axioms. If I would have introduced as another axiom for all x and for all y and for all z, uh, y, q, x, and, uh, or sorry, z, q, y, and y, q, x implies z, q, x, then that would have been a redundant axiom because we can prove that from this axiom. All the theorems, all the theorems we prove from these, if we would have instead tried to introduce those as axioms, they would have been redundant, because we can prove them from the axioms. They didn't give us new information in a sense. A times B is equal to B times A is an axiom, isn't it? Uh, yes. But the, the, the times in of itself is A, you can, you can derive out. There is a set theoretical way to define. So we have two ways that we come at systems of mathematics. So one way I can come at it is we can talk about arithmetic, which has the axiom that you're talking about. I can have the field arithmetic with its axioms, a1, a2, da, 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 da. And I can have the field of geometry with its axioms, a1, a2, da, 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 da. And they're, they're different fields. Now we have a field called set theory. Set theory, shouldn't have drawn those little boxes like that. Here's arithmetic, here's geometry, here's some other field of knowledge, who cares? Some other mathematical system, who cares? Set theory is the one that underlies all of them. And we can actually start with the axioms of set theory, and then rather than starting with the axioms here, we start with the axioms here and we prove all the axioms there as starting points. And we can go from there. And so set theory we can use to derive all these fields if we want. So I can, using set theory, construct a notion of multiplication from addition, and that's possible. Or I can say, you know what, I'm just going to start with the axioms of arithmetic and go from there. So in a sense, yes. Yes to what exactly? In a sense, there is a way to construct it. But if you're just looking at arithmetic, so now we're just looking over here, we're not getting constructed from set theory. None of those axioms uh, define multiplication. Okay. 
Multiplication is undefined in arithmetic. It's an undefined operator. It shows up in your axiom. Remember over here, Q is undefined. But I is defined in terms of Q, and P is defined in terms of Q. In arithmetic, plus and multiplication are undefined operators. And so they don't have a definition. Don't they in the axioms? They show up in the axioms. So the axioms of arithmetic are, like the first axiom of arithmetic, I'm not sure I'll get them all off the top of my head. It's for all x and for all y, x times y is equal to y times x, x plus y is equal to y plus x. Uh, we have commutativity x times y times z is equal to x times y times z, and there's like 10 of them, so basic properties. Okay, so, tech, so everything can be broken down into more basic axiom set theory than logic and so on. But what you're It saying, was shown okay. that our different fields of mathematics could all reduce to set theory. That was a discovery. They used to be treated like completely separate fields. And so it was realized that there was a way to connect them all to set theory. But so in, so in arithmetic, the times is not defined as this number plus 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 plus. You know, it's actually just itself. It happens to be a consequence of the axioms. So you look at the axioms. Yeah. And it just so happens that the way those axioms are makes addition and multiplication behave the way that they do. They behave the way that they do as a consequence of the axioms. So the times is definition. It's not defined. It's not defined in that context of that field. Yes. If we do, we're just doing so we will eventually do arithmetic in this class. And we'll do some basic proofs with arithmetic. And we'll start with those as axioms. And we're gonna see plus and times they have no definition. So and we can just do with them what the axioms say we can do. Multiplication is not defined as repeated addition. Multiplication is not defined as repeated addition in arithmetic. In arithmetic. Just, and you have to be careful to specify the field. Because in general, most people would agree to see. If you said, multiplication is not defined in terms of addition, most people say that's true. So It's not defined at all. Does that also mean that... Most people would say multiplication is undefined. Most people don't understand. Because most mathematicians. <laughs> yeah. They would say it's an undefined operator in your axioms on arithmetic. Most of them don't think in the context of let's connect everything to set theory. When they think about geometry, they think about geometry as a standalone thing. Arithmetic is a standalone thing. Yeah, let's not connect all the logic. I can see the, the, the simplicity of that. Yeah, it's neat to see how it all connects back to set theory. That's cool. But in practice, when you're teaching students, you start with the axioms on one field and go from there. Yeah, it's neat to see how multiplication connects to addition, but it's not relevant. Okay, yes. Because the connection they get through the axioms is enough for them to get the behavior that you're used to them to having. Is Exponents also defined axiomatic. Now, exponents are defined in terms of multiplication. Okay. Division is defined in terms of multiplication. Right. Subtraction is defined in terms of addition. The only two undefined operators in arithmetic are plus and times. And the only two undefined numbers are 0 and 1. Every other number has a definition. Every other uh, operation has a definition. And the negative is just a number inside of the um, a negative comes from one of the axioms. One of the axioms is that for all x, there exists a y such that x plus y is equal to the additive identity. And then there's another one that says for all x, there exists a y. For all x where x is not 0, there exists a y such that x times y is equal to the multiplicative identity. And that's another axiom. And so those two axioms, the first one is what gives us our negative numbers. That's the one that enables us to start defining negative numbers. And the other one is what enables us to start defining inverses and fractions. Instead of 5, we can now define 1 fifth in terms of 5, the same way that we can define negative 5 in terms of 5. That's neat. It is neat. And we'll get to all that neat stuff. <laughs> Okay, proving axioms are independent of each other. So we don't want to introduce an axiom if it could have just been a theorem. 
If it could have just been a theorem, let it be a theorem. If it couldn't have been a theorem, okay, now we'll introduce it as an axiom. So, how do we prove axioms are independent of each other? So if I want to show that axiom 4 is actually independent of axiom 1 and axiom 2 and axiom 3, the way I do that is I prove that a1 and a2 and a3 implies a4 is an invalid argument. I prove it's impossible for these to be true. Sorry, I prove it's possible for all these to be true and this to be false. If it's possible for all these to be true and, these, and this to be false, then these being true must not imply this is true. And so it must actually introduce something new. Is that the only way to prove they are independent? independent. I don't know if it's the only way, it's a common way. Is, it's is the it normal way. inclusive way or does that miss some cases? This will always work. Okay. Because you can't prove a valid argument invalid. <laughs> right. And so if it if it is possible to get this from these, then the argument is valid. So you couldn't prove it invalid. If you proved it invalid, then it must not be invalid. <laughs> Wait, is that trying to say that, that you can't have um, axioms described as uh, imply other axioms? Correct. We don't want that to be possible. Right. If that is possible, we want a way of detecting that. You're sitting there and you're like, oh shoot. Is this axiom of, I'm about to introduce, could I have just proved it from the axioms I already have? That's not and let's see. I look at this argument, and I see if I can find out if it's invalid. If I can show that this argument is invalid, then that axiom needs to be introduced as an axiom. We can have proved it. I see. All right, so those are the three things that interpretation is useful for. Showing an argument is invalid, Showing premises are consistent, and then showing an axiom is independent, which is the same thing as showing an argument is invalid. This is very closely related to this. Let's see an example. Uh, proven argument is invalid. Some men are liars, Adam is a man, therefore, Adam is a liar. How can we prove this argument invalid? Maybe let's write out what these are really quick. Give me the notation. I need to write this. Some men are liars. How do we write that? There exists. There exists. There exists. An X. What's that? Liar applies to X. Yeah, okay, but I'm going to do the man first. M applies to X and L applies to X. There exists an X such that X is a man and X is a liar. So, so far, just wrote down the first premise. Let's write the second premise. Adam is a man. How do we write that? Let's say man applies to a constant A. Yeah. Man applies to Adam. Remember, Adam there is a constant. It's a particular thing. Adam is a man is a proposition. That's true or false. Because now we're talking about an individual particular thing. Adam. Okay. Therefore, what's our conclusion? Liar applies to Adam. Liar applies to Adam. Is this a valid argument? It's not. How do we show it's an invalid argument? We come up with the interpretation that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. So what should our interpretation be? Um, when you just replacing all the x's with Adam? No, that's not what I was thinking. Okay. We just, first off, what should our objects be? It's not a. It's Usually it's easy for us to think about mathematical objects. So let's think about numbers. Right? Okay. Now let's think. M needs to be some statement about numbers. What should it be? How about is even? Okay. You with me? Okay. All right. So there exists an X 
such that even applies to x, and we need some other predicate about numbers. Prime. 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 And prime applies to x. Is that true? Yes. Does there exist a number that's both even and prime? Yes. Yes. What is it? Two. Two. Okay, so this is true. Check. M was, M we replace with even. So now I need a constant that's even. Four. Four is even. Even applies to four. Is that true? Yep, it is. Check. What's our conclusion? Prime applies to four. Prime applies to four. Not true. Is that true? No. 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 All right. True premises, false conclusion. Since it was possible to do that, the argument must have been invalid. That makes sense. If you go back to last time, when we prove from this axiom and this axiom, you can come up with some theory. You can stay up all night and the next 10 days after that. Plugging in any domain and any interpretation you want, you'll never get the argument invalid. You'll never be able to do to it what we just did to this argument. I, I feel like we were able to apply the exact same uh, like kind of abstract, intuitive perspective or, or that, that, in fact, that the statement was false because obviously Adam is just somebody, it, that we were able to apply the other. We, so we intentionally picked one where it's obvious to your intuition already it's invalid. And the other one was also obvious to our intuition. We tried to go to one that's even more obvious. The point is how you might do it. Your process. So we already picked one that was hopefully already pretty intuitive to you. But you can imagine that we gave you some big long string of sentences. Going back over here, when we were reasoning about these things in terms of just Q's and I's and P's, it was a lot harder to tell right off the bat, wait, is that true? But when we converted it to mathematical notation, it was much easier for us to say, oh, that's true. Oh, that's false. That's all we're trying to do here. So, it, okay, so this is just trying to make it easier to appeal for intuition. It's just showing you the process. Okay. But yes, ultimately that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to go for something that, ah, maybe, maybe not, to something that, okay, for sure. No question about it. Interesting. And that's all we're doing. And yeah, maybe a more convoluted example would have helped. But I just wrote what the author gave me. And that makes sense. I mean, that's, that was a good example because we've never done the process before. All right. Next one. So we did an example of proving an argument is invalid. Proving premises are consistent. We already did an example of that. These two axioms are consistent. How do we know? We came up, or sorry, these two axioms are consistent. How do we know? We came up with interpretations that make both of them true. Notice that this is true and this is true. Therefore, these axioms are consistent. That's how you prove that. All right, third one. Proving axioms are independent. Now let's prove that these two axioms are actually independent of each other. Let's prove it's impossible to prove one of them from the other. So I'm going to show that if you start with axiom two, you can never prove axiom one. Or in other words, I'm going to show the argument, this implies this, is invalid argument. It's going to be a little bit weird first time we see this. All right. So example, A1 and A2, those two axioms right over there, are independent. Or in other words, A2 implies A1 is an invalid argument. That's the way I'm going to show it. I could have just as well shown that A1 implies A2 is an invalid argument. You have to sh you'd have to show both of them to prove that they're independent, right? Just one. Okay. Why is one? Uh, because... If they were somehow equivalent, then they'd be logically equivalent, <laughs> which means it would go both ways. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyways. So what are we going to do? So I'm trying to show that this argument is invalid. So I need to come up with an interpretation for the argument A2 implies A1. That interpretation needs to make A2 true, but A1 false. I need to come up with an interpretation. That makes this true, or sorry, that makes this true, but this false. Here's my premise, here's my conclusion. I'm showing this is your premise, and this is your conclusion is an invalid argument. 
I've shown it is impossible to prove that if this is true, then this is true. That's what I'm showing is impossible. I'm going to find an interpretation that makes A2 true, but A1 false. If I can do that, then this implies this is not a valid argument. And so these two axioms are independent, and you actually need them both as axioms. Does that make sense what I'm trying to do? Follow the logic there? Just nod till I go? <laughs> All right. So here's the interpretation I'm going to do. I'm going to interpret xqy as the is less than even if you add one relation. Is less than or equal to even if you add one relation. What do we mean by xqy? We mean x is less than or equal to y even if you add one to y. That's the interpretation we're choosing. Okay. Perfectly valid relation. It takes two variables. And if you give me two variables, I'll spit out true or false. So y plus 1 is a term. y plus 1 is a term. But you can think about this as my function. It gives me, you give me an x and a y, and I tell you if this is true or false. That's what this has to be. It has to be something that if you give me an x and a y, I spit out true or false. This is something that if you give it an x and a y, it spits out true or false. I think it helps to turn the x and the y inside the formula to be some other letter. Because it's implying kind of like of, of the previous term. The terms are now also inside of themselves. Let me give it to you special. <laughs> That's what Q is. Oh. <laughs> I see. All right. Very special for Parley. Helps if you know how to program. <laughs> Anyways, so there's our interpretation. That I'm going to choose to do. So here's what our argument is that I'm going to prove is invalid using our interpretation. I'm showing that if for all x and for all y, x is less than or equal to y plus 1. Or, oh sorry, we're doing the second one. So I'm rewriting this now. Rewriting this with my interpretation. Plug, sorry. This one. Get a dark line next to it so I don't mess it. Here's A2. I'm plugging in the Q here. So my argument is, I'm showing you what the argument is that's invalid. I'm rewriting this. If this, therefore this. And I'm showing that's invalid. Plugging in my Q now with this. Replacing that with that in A2. That's what this is. Sugar. All right, hopefully you can read that. I'll say it out loud in case you can. If for all x and for all y, x is, not if, oh, if because of that. If it's a case that for all x and for all y, you have x is less than or equal to y plus one, or y is less than or equal to x plus one, then it's the case that for all x and for all y and for all z, that, if x is less than or equal to y plus 1 and y is less than or equal to z plus 1, then x is less than or equal to z plus 1. This is rewriting out a2, doing this substitution, and this is rewriting out a1, doing this substitution. So I just wrote if a1, then a2. And that whole argument is invalid. That's what I'm showing. I'm showing this is an invalid argument. And I've done part of my interpretation. With me so far? Okay, this is invalid. Here's the interpretation I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose x to be 3, y to be 2, and z to be 1. Notice that my antecedent will be true and my conclusion will be false. Is it true that 3 is less than or equal to 2 plus 1 or 2 is less than or equal to 3 plus 1? Yes. Yes, so my antecedent is true. But look at my conclusion. Is it true that 3 is less than or equal that if 3 is less than or equal to 2 plus 1, 
and two is less than or equal to one plus one. That three is less than or equal to one plus one. In other words, is this true? No. No. Because true implies false. Because you get true implies false. Or in other words, we did what you did in math all the time, we call a counterexample. I came up with my x, y, and z that made the statement false. I found an interpretation that made the statement false. Therefore, A1 and A2 are independent. Do you not have to go back for A1 or A2? Do I not have to go back? So do you not have to flip A1 implies A2 and through No. Back? If, so this showed that A2 and A1 are independent. If A2 and A1 are independent, A1 and A2 are independent. Because the only other option is they're logically equivalent. It's somehow a restatement of the same thing. Okay. And so remember what logically equivalent means. Alpha is logically equivalent to beta means alpha implies beta and beta implies alpha. If I can show one of those implications doesn't work, they're not logically equivalent. If I show alpha doesn't imply beta, then alpha and beta can't be logically equivalent. And they must be saying something different. Okay. But wouldn't an axiom imply a theorem? But that doesn't mean the theorem implies the axiom. Does that make sense? Uh, so what if A1 was a theorem? A theorem is somehow logically equivalent to the axioms it's dependent upon. But you couldn't take a theorem and imply an axiom, or you could. It, so we sometimes do that. So in some systems, even in geometry, some authors choose one place as their axioms, and they have other things as theorems. Other people take other things as their axioms and prove those other things to be theorems from their different axioms. That's a common thing. Okay. So you did discrete math. Mm -hmm. But you didn't do real analysis. No. It's the only way I can think of off the top of my head. In one, we prove induction from the well-ordering principle. In another, we prove the well-ordering principle from induction. And which one you start with is sixes. Okay. Well, they both have to be proved, don't they? No. So in discrete math, the well-ordering principle was an axiom. I thought in calculus or real analysis we proved. No, in real analysis you had the least upper bound property, the suprema. Right, so you use that to prove induction. You use that to prove induction and induction to talk about the well-ordering principle. Yeah. And so you come at it completely different. But it wasn't considered an axiom. Yet. The suprema one was though. Right. Yeah. Different strike points. Yeah. And so Yes, there are different axioms that prove the exact same theorems. You can use Euclid's axioms for proving Euclidean geometry, or you can use Hilbert's axioms for proving Euclidean geometry. Completely different starting points. Uh, one of the most famous ones is uh, Euclid's fifth, the parallel postulate. The way that Euclid states his parallel postulate is kind of a mouthful. And so most people, even when they're doing Euclidean geometry, they restate his parallel postulate, his fifth axiom. They instead say, if you're given a line and a point not on the line, then there is just one and only one line through the given point such that the two lines never intersect. That's the way we typically say Euclid's fifth. That's not what he said. He has his own axiom. It turns out it's logically equivalent to this. You can use his axiom to prove this is true, or you can use what I just said to prove his axiom is true. But his is such a mouthful that we realize this is logically equivalent and doesn't change anything, so we'll use it instead. Okay. Is it somehow more fundamental? Does it have less It's in no way more fundamental. Can't really say it's more fundamental. It's just easier to say to a student. It appeals to your intuition better the way that I just said it versus the way that he would say it. And you can read his. His is a mouthful. I'm just wondering why he would use his when there's, when there's this one. Is 
this new? Is this, is this coming up after him? Yes, this is after him, the way that people typically say it. Okay. He said it the way he said it, and it's the way he said it. The axiom existed before, how was it said before? Is it, the axiom was... So Euclid has his way of saying it, and then this would have been a theorem. Right. So Euclid proves this. So what was the axiom before you? Euclid? Oh, no, Euclid. Sorry, I'm thinking of a different person. My bad. Yeah, I don't okay. know how to go before Euclid in geometry. No, we're good. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was thinking of something wrong. Euclid's the first one to set up geometry as an axiomatic system. That's the amazing thing Euclid did. There were all these theorems of geometry that were done. It was known that if you start here, you can prove this. If you start here, you can prove this. If you start here, you can prove this. He kind of reverse engineered it all down to just five postulates. And he said, actually, if you just start with these five things and then use five common notions that he got from Aristotle's working on, essentially, then you can derive all of this. And that was a big breakthrough of his. It's thought that very little of the actual theorems in the book are his own theorems. He just took all the knowledge of his own and organized it all that way. He just did that, but that was a huge achievement. Yeah, it is. <laughs> No reason for it to be obvious that all this comes for free if you just assume these five statements. And that's what he shows. Yeah. We did all that, right? Yep. I didn't skip anything. Okay. Let's move on then to inference with existential quantifiers. Restricted inference now with existential quantifiers. So up till now, the proofs, we limit ourselves to just using the universal quantifier, meaning this symbol. Now we want to do proofs that have the actual existential quantifier in them and introduce our two rules for how we work with existential, quanti existential quantifiers. These two rules are going to be almost identical to the ones that we had for universal quantifiers. For universal quantifiers, we had the rule of universal specification and we had the rule of universal generalization. Universal specification said, in short, that if for all x you have some predicate about x, then you can conclude that for some arbitrary y, or x, or whatever variable you want, that predicate must be true about an arbitrary element. If it's true for anything, it must be true for an arbitrary thing, or for anything. If it's true for everything, it must be true for anything. Universal generalization was almost the converse of that. It says that if you show P of Y, if you show it's true for an arbitrary element, then you show it's true for all Y. For all Y, P of Y. But we had one big restriction on this. We can only apply this rule where what? Why it has to be a variable. Why is a variable, but it's a special variable. Or it's not a bad variable, a flagged variable. Remember what a flagged variable is? It's a free variable introduced in the premise. Okay. Let's do a bad proof really quick. Okay. One, I introduce as my premise, uh, I can't remember what we did last time. Uh, being three headed applies to someone. I introduce that as a premise, uh, it's using rule P, it only depends upon itself for its validity. Two. I then conclude for all x, three-headedness applies. This was using universal generalization, cheating, on line one, and it's still just dependent upon one for its validity. And then I get rid of one as a premise using conditional proof. I show that if three-headedness applies to something, then everything is three-headed. And now this doesn't depend on any premises. This was using conditional proof from one to two. And now it doesn't depend on premise. So it says as a universal logic, if you have three-headedness, then everything's three-headed. Is that true? No, this is a bad proof. Oh. We cheated. The cheat was, 
x here is a flagged variable. And so when we wrote 1, we would write 1 with a little x here to remind us x was flagged in there. x was flagged in there. And then we went here. You can't universally generalize on a flagged variable. A flagged variable is a variable that's free in the premise it was introduced in. x was introduced in this line as a premise, and it was a free variable where it was introduced. And so you can't do this. We cheated. That's what a flag variable was. OK. So now we're going to come up with our rules for existential specification, which is the one that gets rid of the existential quantifier, and then existential, existential generalization, which is the one that adds the quantifier. And it's a very similar rule. Before that, say a little bit about the actual concepts of existential specification and existential generalization, and then we'll state the rules explicitly. So the concept for existential specification. The assertion that there is something satisfying a given condition implies that the given condition is satisfied by some nameable individual. If there exists something that makes a statement true, then we should be able to name a thing that makes a statement true. If it sounds like I'm basically saying the exact same thing twice, good. What does naming it mean in this context? Naming it, uh, it's a constant of something. It's an individual thing that makes it true. There's an individual thing that makes that thing true. It's like saying there exists an odd number that can be three. Now you need it. Okay. It's finding a specific example. Existential generalization is the converse of this. It's saying that if you can name something that satisfies the condition, if the thing that satisfies the condition can be named, then there is something that satisfies the condition. Hopefully those both seem like pretty straightforward concepts. Now, let's give a concrete example. You know how John Doe is often used in like a hospital or like a murder? And they use John Doe. It's some unidentified individual. Right? There's a car crash. Some guy gets injured. He doesn't have any identification. He's rushed to the emergency room. They're going to call him a John Doe. He's an individual particular person. But we don't know who exactly it is. And so we call him John Doe. All right. Okay. So we can conclude from the statement that there exists someone in the hospital that John Doe is in the hospital. Some arbitrary person. John Doe's a stand in for, I, I don't know who it is, but I look right by binoculars. I see someone in the hospital, some dude in the hospital. You say, ah, John Doe's in the hospital. Who exactly it is, I don't know. Can't identify him exactly. So I can still go from this to this. More concrete way we might do that in math is I know that if there exists some x such that x is greater than 2, I can say, okay, then there's some beta greater than 2, where beta is the thing that satisfies that condition. And that's naming it? Yeah. Let beta be the thing greater than 2. We say that all the time in our math groups. Something like that. There's a lot of betas that could be greater than two. Right. So the point is, two things are going on here. This is not a variable. John Doe is not a variable. He's a constant. He's a constant. He's a particular person. You just don't know. John Doe, he's laying right there. He's that dead body. John Doe. We don't know his name, but he's that person. Okay. So it's not a variable. It's not like when we say cows. Cows produce milk. Cows, in that sense, is a variable. We weren't talking about a particular cow. Mm -hmm. Betsy, the cow, is a constant. John Doe, the cow, is also a constant. We just don't know his name. We don't know that cow's name. So it's a constant it's like that we don't know the name to. We call these things ambiguous. The author calls them ambiguous names. And it's basically constants that we don't know. Now, that might seem funny to you. You might think, what, when, how, where would I ever use something as dumb as that? You do it all the time. Here's an example of one you've seen a hundred times. If ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, then this is true. And if I say, what's a in there? You would all say it's a constant. Which constant? John Doe. <laughs> it's the John Doe constant. You do this a lot of time in math. 
So you look at this statement, 2 is a constant, but a is also a constant. Which constant is a? I don't know, but it's a constant. It's not a variable. X is our variable. A is our constant. So that's what the author would call an ambiguously named constant. And so with existential quantifiers, we work with these ambiguously named constants all the time. If there exists something that satisfies a condition, we let our ambiguously named constant be the thing. And you're used to doing that in your proofs all the time. We need to do math proofs. All right. So that's the hardest thing, I think, for this section, is wrapping your head around these ambiguous named things, ambiguous names, these constants, individual things that we just don't know the name of, but it's not a variable. OK, maybe I'm overstressing it. Let's just jump to the rules then. All right, the first rule. Our rule for existential specification. Our rule for ex existential specification. And then I got an accompanying example right there. So read it, then go over the example with it. Maybe, maybe just say it in words, then read that, and you'll see how it connects. Here's what this one's going to say. It's going to say if we have something like this, we can conclude something like this. It's going to say if there exists an x such that x is greater than 2, then there's some ambiguous name, some beta greater than 2. This is going to be the r in there. This is going to be the s in there. Doesn't the there exists make x an ambiguous name? They're so closely related, it hurts. And they're related by these rules. Because these rules are saying how we go back and forth between them. Because our rules of inference, remember, going all the way back to our rules of logic, our rules of logic don't know how to work with an existential quantifier. Okay. Our rules of logic were like how not alpha and beta is not alpha or not beta. That didn't have an existential quantifier in it. Yeah. And I want to use that rule of logic. So I gotta get rid of the existential quantifier somehow, so I can use that rule of logic. Okay. This is how we're gonna get rid of it. So that we can start using our rules of logic. All right. And then we're gonna go back and plug it back in using the rule you expect. Mm -hmm. Very similar to universal generalization, universal specification, universal generalization. So yes, they're very closely related. So you can't switch the spot of beta less than two and x less than two? The rule is going to say how we can go from this to this. So let's read the rule and then re-ask it if I didn't answer it, because I'm not sure I follow you. If a formula S results from a formula R by substituting every free occurrence of a variable in X, or sorry, every free variable every occurrence of a free variable x in r notice r is just the same without the existential quantifier that's r x is free in r it's only when you include the existential quantifier that's no longer free so when we look at just r x is a free variable in r we replace x with beta that's what the rule is going to say we can do so if a formula s results from a formula r by substituting every free occurrence of a variable x in R, by substituting for every occurrence of a variable x in R, some ambiguous name, like beta, which has not been previously used in the derivation. You can't use a beta if it's already the name for something. You got to pick something else. Otherwise, it would name the previous name. Okay, which has not been previously used in the derivation, then we can derive from there exists x such that r, we can derive s. Or then s is derivable, s is derivable from there exists x, r. Okay, what was your question then? It was answered. It was answered, great. Existential generalization now is going the other way. It's the one that I think is the more intuitive of the two. It's one that says, if I know that there's something, if I can find an ambiguously named thing greater than two, or I can find a particular thing that I know the name of it greater than two, 
then I know that there must exist something greater than two. Right? Yeah. It's like if I got a John Doe in here and I got Jeremy in here. If I measure John Doe and he's over five feet, then I know there exists someone in here who's over five feet. <laughs> or if I measure Jeremy, someone I actually know the name of, and he's over five feet, then I know that there's someone in here over five feet. The fact that I'm not sure what his name is doesn't mean that there wasn't someone that satisfied it. Okay. So if you can find something that satisfies a condition, maybe you know its name, maybe you don't. But if you can find something that satisfies a condition, then there exists something that satisfies the condition. That's what the generalizing one does. So now let's read the generalizing one. If a formula S, if a formula S results from a formula R by substituting a variable X for every occurrence of a name or for every constant in R, could be an ambiguously named one, or it could have been, we could have replaced the two if we wanted. In this case, we're replacing this one down here. We chose to replace the five. So by replacing a variable X for every occurrence of a name, maybe an ambiguous name, in R, then we can conclude there exists X such that S from R. Or in other words, there exists X such that S is derivable from R. That's what the rules say we can do. And with that, we finish all our rules of derivation. So your um, laws of universal generalization, specification, and your existential ones are not considered rules of inference. They're rules of derivation, but not inference. Same thing. So, so good point. Okay. One, so we one. have two things that we're going to mix up. Because you mentioned that we could use it before. Right. So our rules of derivation and our rules of logical inference are the same thing. We have eight of those rules. And then we have our rules of logic. Those were all the tautologies that we showed before. This was a rule of logic, not alpha and beta, is logically equivalent to not alpha or not beta. So there, using that, that's a rule of logic. You could say there's an infinite number of rules of logic. There's an infinite number of rules of logic. Okay. Our rules of derivation, or our rules of logical inference, we had exactly eight of them. Our first rule was our rule P for introducing a premise. We may introduce a premise at any point. Our second rule was T, rule T. We can introduce a line as long as it was tautologically implied by previous lines. Then we had our rule CP. CP says that if we can show alpha How did we typically write this as a truth table? If we can show our premises, our premises and alpha implies beta, then that's the same thing as showing our premises implies alpha implies beta. There we go. That's what it was. We can show this is the case, then we can say this is the case. And it enables us to remove alpha as a premise and just have alpha implied beta as a conclusion. Is that, a, is that something that was proved or is that just a... That can be shown with just a truth table. So technically... This is logically equivalent to this thing. Does that mean that your conditional premise rule is really included in the other rules? No. It, because it also enables us to remove alpha as a premise. Is that not a tautology? This being logically equivalent to this is a tautology. So then, if so so far we're just using a tautology, but then we also remove alpha as a premise. That's where the rule making it a rule of derivation comes in. Okay. It's like when you say, "I want you to prove that if a number is even." then its square is also even. Okay. You say, let x be an even number. So I say, so for the end of time, x is an even number? You're saying, well, no, it is for the cases of this proof, but once I show if it's even, then the conclusion's even, then we're done. 
and x is no longer an even number after that. It's like you temporarily pretend x represents an even number until you come to your conclusion. Then when it's all said and done, you said, now we show, based off of all the math we've done so far, if x is even, then x squared is even. Okay. So you said, let our premises, everything we presuppose so far in the class, and let x be even. Right. Then x squared is even. Now we're no longer pretending x is even after that. And we're saying, okay, so if x is even, then x squared is even. And you can't do that with tautology. You use the fact that it's tautologically implied, but then you also remove it as a premise. It didn't have to be a new axiom that x is even. We didn't have to introduce that as an axiom. We temporarily pretend like it is. Right. Well, even in this case, you're not technically adding it to your axioms. Uh, we would, in our proof, have to keep track of that as a premise. You need to see a derivation. I, I, I see kind of what you're saying. Mean, I'll show you when we... We'll definitely use a rule, and I'll show you why it's more than the fact that this is just equivalent to this. This is equivalent to this, makes us comfortable with it, but then we're actually going to remove it as a premise, which is where the rule comes in. I'm seeing with your with the way that you've written it out, you're not including out as a, as a premise in the set of premises. Here it was in the set of premises. You're treating it like a premise. We took our premises that we already had, and then we add this as a premise. And we just added it. You said let x be an even number. Some kid says, how do you know x is even? I don't know x is even, I'm saying let it be even. Okay. You introduce alpha as a premise. I say, how do you know alpha? You say, I don't, just, just go with me for a second. I see what you're saying. No. Let's pretend it's even. Then, x squared is even. So we showed that if we did let it be true, then this would be true. And now we remove it as a premise. And now our premises are back to what they were before. That's where we use CP for. So CP, that was conditional proof, enables us to temporarily add a premise that we promise we're going to remove later. And it tells us how we can remove a premise. And then four was reductio ad absurdum. Same type of thing. We introduce a premise, but we say it's going to lead to a conclusion as though we're going to remove the premise and say that it must have been false. And this is the same case where it's not just useful, it also can't be implied as useful. It removes a premise. So that's why it's a rule of inference. Uh, and then five was, what was five? Why did I think there were eight of these? Oh, because there are. <laughs> and then we had universal specification, universal generalization, and then existential specification, and then existential generalization. And these are our eight rules. Did I miss any? Quick question. You got all eight? Is your reductio out of certain a type of conditional proof? Uh, kind of. Reductio ad absurdum, we show that our premises, Meet our premises else. together with alpha implies a contradiction. And so it says we go from that to our premises must then imply not alpha. That seems like conditional proof, I mean, plus a tautology. Like you kind of combine two things. This rule can be derived from these two rules. So why have it? Using the rule of excluded middle. Using uh, the fact that this is a tautology. Right. X or not X. So the reason we have that separate just is useful. because there are, that's a good reason, so it's useful, but there are mathematical, what do they call themselves? I think they call themselves intuitionalists. These are math petitions who hate themselves. <laughs> and they refuse to accept the law of excluded middle as a tautology. Why? They refuse to accept it as a tautology. They don't think that you can conclude, just because you show that something's not false, they don't think you can therefore say it's true. They think you have, maybe they call themselves constructionists or something like that. You actually have to construct something validating it is true. And so they refuse to use it, and they refuse to use reductio ad absurdum. And they try to reprove all of mathematics. So Thus far, it doesn't seem like it makes any difference. So either way, there's no point in putting it as an additional rule. They would tell you that there is a reason, because they don't use it. Well, if they don't use it, then there's no point having it. We use it all the time. So then don't leave it as an extra rule. 
We use it as an extra rule because we accept the logic that validated the rule. Sure. Oh, you're saying they wouldn't they wouldn't accept it because it well, maybe I don't know. It's they just, will not right. list that rule because they don't accept the logic that we use to validate the rule. If we don't list that rule, that doesn't prevent us from using that logic. So why put it as a rule? Every time we use this rule, we're using this logic behind the scenes. Right. My, I just I feel like it's redundant to put it on the list as a separate thing when it's included in the other rules. It's not really included in the other rules unless you accept this. It's included in the other rules if you accept this piece of logic. It's not included in the other rules if you don't accept this piece of logic. Right. So and so it's another way of us saying, behind the scenes, we're accepting this piece of logic to be true, and this is the way it usually comes out useful to us. My question is, the people that don't accept that rule wouldn't put it on the list anyway. So the people who don't accept that rule would not have this on the list. And so if your list doesn't have number four, then you know you're dealing with constructionists. For the people that accept that rule, it doesn't need to be on the list. Right, then we'd be using an identical list for doing two different things. But you could do it without it on the list. <laughs> but then you need to somehow state, does, are, am I allowing this? You can state that explicitly. You could, as another rule. <clears throat> oh, okay, I guess. This is a way that ends up being useful. So let's state that as the rule. Okay, all right, gotcha. All right. But yeah. So that it's literally only there for constructions. So that's the reason it's there. Uh, it's useful. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's probably there because historically that method of proof has been used a lot. Right. But, I mean, there's a lot of other methods that aren't on the list. Yeah, it's just like, why do we choose the sentential connections that we do? Why do I use and and or, but not nand or nor? Because NAND and NOR can be defined in terms of AND and NOR. I can define everything in terms of just NAND. I can just use the NAND operator and define all of it. That's true. So why use the other ones? It's convenient. Historically, we use them a lot. They come up a lot. Get people comfortable with them. So a lot of the answers to questions like that is it's just smart convention. So they just like do a more roundabout way of accomplishing the same result? Yes. Okay. So their proofs get much bigger, much more tedious, much harder to do, and they have to be a lot more clever about them. And, not one and thus far, it seems like they're logically equivalent systems. Have they been able to find a single situation where it's not the case? It has yet to be. I assume if it had been done, it would be huge news and I would have heard about it, but I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you a couple of years ago that thus far, there had been no difference. So they're just actively hating themselves because it is a pain. <laughs> it does, okay, are there not proofs where the only way to prove it that we know of so far is to use reductio ad absurdum? No, because every we can proof. derive reductio ad absurdum from the other proofs. Every so I did. Proof we did a couple proofs. of those uh, yeah. last time. So in our last lecture, I did, we did some proofs that naturally you would do reductio ad absurdum for them. And I tried to show you a way that you could come up with introducing a tautology as a premise and still come to a conclusion. So for every major proof that is fundamental to our mathematics that we accept, they found a proof that doesn't use that rule. They're still developing it. Does reductio ad absurdum actually add anything? Does the law of excluded middle actually add anything? Thus far, it seems like the answer is no. It's just a nice to have. Their dream is that they can find something that using that rule you were able to conclude that without using the rule you couldn't have concluded. And so that the rule is actually adding something. Right. That would be their dream. They've yet to succeed. <laughs> so they so they're virtually working on that they haven't done that yet. Correct. I assume. Maybe they've all given up. Uh, you think. Because it's like I'm I'm looking at all these proofs and like real analysis and stuff where you use that. You're taking real analysis? No, I'm thinking of calculus, but it oh. applies to real analysis. I mean, it's just a specific case. But in calculus, you have a proof that's reductio ad absurdum, or a proof by contradiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
to do that for every one of the proofs that is major to that field would be just seems very very difficult yeah it's it's tedious and you have to be clever about how you get started and yeah if you watch lectures we did last time i tried to give some intuition for that and how it was using that law of excluded middle behind the scenes and so I did it using the law of excluded middle directly, disimproves, and then did them by proof by contradiction, did the exact same proof. Okay, let's do some proofs. Three examples and we'll call it. First example, all humans are mortal. There are humans, therefore there are mortals. True. Seems straightforward enough. So we're gonna do the proof and we're gonna write out every stupid detail to make it super explicit on these first couple proofs. And then we'll start being fast and loose. So, what's my first premise? For all x, where h applies to x. I don't know how to write where. Just well, just exactly how you have it. H, hx or whatever. There's a predicate h or not, or what? hx or whatever. <laughs> There's another whatever. And then mx. And mx, yeah. And mx. And? Yes. Everything is a human immortal. No. 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 Okay. Every human is. It's HX implied. You have to have an implication. The implication. There we go. If it's a human, then it's mortal. Yeah. That's what we're saying. All right. There's premise one. Oh, sorry. So this is the rule is P. And thus far, we only depend upon premise one for our validity. All right, next. There exists an x where h applies to x. There exists x such that h of x. There exists a human. That was a premise. Two. All right, now what? Autologically implied. And you you're going to use the law of uh, specification, right? We need to, which one are we going to specify first? I would start with number two. Okay. Because we're gonna have to use an ambiguous name here. You'd say let there be some human or We can't say, write let. Right. You'd say So we need to say H applies to Typically I'd use alpha, but my alpha is like too much like uh, X, so I always use beta. Okay. Beta. Some ambiguous name constant. And this is your law of specification. This is using existential specification. And it's only dependent upon premise two for its validity. So we know that there exists something that's a human. There he is, John Doe. So John Doe's a human. All right. Universally, universally specify on this one. And when I universally specify on this one, I can plug in whatever I want for that axis. Beta seems like a pretty useful thing to plug in for those excerpts. Yeah. That's why I want to do this one first, then this one, so we can get our beta. Because we can't get our beta here. Our beta has to come from here. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. I guess we could have. Just would have been kind of weird. So then I know that if beta is a human, then beta is mortal. This is universal specification, and I forgot to list the line number. This was existential specification on two, this was universal specification on one. This now depends on line one, I guess just one. We just called it beta. We didn't combine them yet. One, one and three, or just one? Just one. Okay. And now we know n applies to beta. All right, now I can take this and this. If I know alpha, and I know alpha implies beta, I know beta. So, five, then I can say man applies to beta. This is tautologically implied by lines three and four. And now, we're dependent upon the premises we were dependent upon on lines three and four, which are premises one and two. Okay? And now we existentially generalize? Existential generalization, perfect. So six then, we say then there exists y, or whatever, such that m applies to y. This is existential generalization 
on line five. And we're independent upon premises one and two. So we only use the two premises that we promised we would to get our conclusion. All right, trying out all the sick gory details. Any questions on any of that? Makes sense. All right. Let's do the next one. All mammals are animals. Some mammals are bipeds. Therefore, some animals are bipeds. You know what a biped is? Walks on two legs. Yes. So humans are bipeds. Some of us. An early definition of humans was a featherless biped. <laughs> Chicken, plug up its yeah, and that was a great counterexample. The man plucked the chicken and he said, Behold, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> so when Aristotle got into definition. And now the Aristotelian notion of definition is pretty much what you use everywhere today. From chemistry onwards, the Aristotelian notion is good enough. What is it? Aristotle's? Aristotle's notion of definition is you state its genus and then its distinguishing characteristic. So when you, dis when you define like an exothermal reaction, exothermal chemical reaction, if you go look that up in a chemistry book, it's going to say it's a chemical reaction, saying it's genus, that releases heat, its distinguishing characteristic. That's getting to the essence of what it means. Essentially, an exothermal chemical reaction is a chemical reaction that releases heat. So it's tied in with his definition of S, or with his theory of essence. And so anytime you say essentially, you're being very Aristotelian. And his theory of definition is what we use for almost everything. It's only when we get down to the nitty gritty that we realize it's a little bit vague and we gotta be more careful. How do we do it today? We will get to the theory of definitions in this class. Cool. That's one of the things we want to cover. All right, uh, what were we doing? We were talking about bipeds. Okay. What's line one? Sorry, let me write. For all x. For all x. M applies to x implies a applies to x. M applies to x implies a applies to x. Yeah. All mammals are animals. If it's a mammal, then it's an animal. Facts. Like it. Uh, this was a premise, and it only depends upon itself. Okay. Next. There exists. There's this X such that what? MX. MX. And B X. And BX. Not implies because it's not all. What does line two say? Some mammals are bipeds. There exists something that's a mammal and a biped. That is correct. Sweet. Not just trying to trick on that. All right, what's next? That's the rest of our premises. So what are we going to do? You have to specify, specify the on that there exists mammal. Yeah, probably easier to existentially specify on this. Let's get John Doe in here. So three, then we know that M applies to John Doe and biped. Applied to John Doe. Yep. That's universal generalization or universal specification. Not uh, universal. Existential. Existential specification two. on two, and we're only dependent upon premises two. All right, what's our next line? Universal general specification of one. Right. So then we're going to do M applies to beta implies A applies to beta. Yep. If John Doe's a man, then he's an animal. This is. Universal specification on one, only dependent upon one for its validity. Okay. And you're going to say um, biped applies to beta. Mm. Could you say animal applies to beta and biped does? A applies to B and B applies to beta? Yeah. That, that might be doing two tautological steps in one direction. Yeah. Let's do it one at a time. Okay. What's the next one we can conclude? If we take that and that together, you'd say animal applies to beta. Animal applies to beta. 
And then the next one. If man applies to beta, then animal applies to beta, and man applies to beta. So this one is tautologically implied by three and four. And now we're using premises one and two. And now we can join that with that. So this is. Uh, Maybe I'll just do that now and just write it on the same line. And biped applies to it. That's bringing that down. This is justified because of this and this gives us that. And then that's just bringing it down. Okay, now what? Um, existential generalization. Existential generalization. So now six. So then there must exist at something that is an animal and that is a biped. Yep. Uh, did you? That's annoying. It's because of existential and E. Uh, existential generalization. Put the quantifier down. Okay. On five. On five. And it's still premises one and two. Alright. And square box. We're done. Alright? Alright. One more. Last one. This one's a little bit more fun. And maybe we'll skip some of the gory detail on this one since it might be kind of bigger. All Aristotle's followers, like all of Aquinas' followers, none of Aristotle's followers, oh, none of Aristotle's, I think I was supposed to put followers here. None of Aristotle's followers like, none of Aristotle's followers like idealists. Therefore, none, none of Aquinas' followers are idealists. <clears throat> it's true. No one likes those idealists. Right? I hope so. All right, what are we doing? Well, you'll start with premises all Aristotle's followers. For all x, yes. where a applies to x. For all x, such that a applies to x. And q of this for Aquinas? Or would it be that applies? And, and q right. for Aquinas. Applies to x. Applies to x. Implies x. Wait, away with two different variables. What? <laughs> <laughs> you can't like themselves. <laughs> Everyone likes himself, <laughs> as long as they follow Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> we need two okay. All right. Uh, were you racing that? Yeah. Right How far are we going? All no, the way? That's good. That's good. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. Are we supposed to follow? If they follow Aristotle, that implies that they follow. That they don't no, like. No, they like. Or that they like. Is like a predicate? Minute. Like so is a predicate. Like. It's going to be a separate predicate. So X, L, Y. X, X L, Y. X likes Y. Which means we need to have And make y, y being a queen as followers. Yeah, Y is its followers. So, so we need a Aquinas. Aquinas. <laughs> Aquinas. Aquinas. Add another quantifier and make Y. Uh, put a quantifier where? Right after the Very for all X. Right after the for all X. Okay, let's just put that down here in case we backtrack. <laughs> for all X, for all Y. AX implies XLY. Do y AX and Aquinas. You gotta go, yeah, AX and Y. Q. Or Q I think we should come at this a little differently and Q start with there exists followers of Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, okay, elementary kids first understand mathematics. I think we could do that right the first time. Are you allowed to do that? I'm allowed to do whatever I want, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I guess so. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. I like that for all X, uh, for all A. So, that is that where we're going? Sure. They had to for all Y, y being all of Aristotle, like all of yeah. Aquinas. Q, Q I I to Q I. Aquinas, it being Aquinas' follower, implies yeah. X. Likes, likes. Yeah. Why did we stick them in the plural bracket? I have a question though. How is that different than what you were about to write for the Yeah, that's right. Second one. Yeah, you could just do it that way. It's just a little simpler. And where do you put Q? I'm wondering, quick wondering. 
And what? What do you do? Y. Q Y. Minus X L Y. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Let's try. Let me think. There is a follower of Aristotle, and there's a follower of Aquinas. Implies that. For all X and for all Y. X like X like Y. X follows Aquinas. guaranteed you could show is that they're independent. No, you want them to not be independent. If you're going to show that they're the same, you need to show that the first one applies to the second one and the second one applies to the first one. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What you're oh. I thought you were saying what we did before, which was for showing how they're independent. You could show that they're not independent. Same thing but not. Showing that they're logically equivalent would be showing that they imply each other. Showing that they're uh, independent would be come up with an interpretation where one's true and the other one's false. Yeah, it would be a little bit more tricky. I'm trying to think. Or, or, or making this false makes the whole thing true. Making yep. this false makes the whole thing true. Making that's some this captures information that we didn't intend then, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't follow this Aristotle, true and Aristotle, this false, then they like the find this false. Makes it true. I don't know. My gut is yeah. my gut is that they're somehow saying because these two are the same. Writing it just using propositions. Alpha implies beta implies gamma. I think is the same thing as alpha and beta. Implies gamma. Yeah, but those all logically equivalent. Isn't that? Part those are behind the conditional proof. Yeah. So then that's in conditional yeah. premise in it. So those are logically equivalent. Which you see how this, those two are very close to the same, and those two are very close to the same. That's why my gut wants to say yes. If that, so does that say that if they don't follow Aristotle, then they like Aquinas' followers? It if, says, they if they don't follow Aristotle, then AX is false, right? It doesn't say anything about if they don't, if they're not Aristotle's follower. If they're not Aristotle's followers, then AX is false. Then AX is false, correct. So false implies anything is true. It, so if you think about ways that make these things true or false, then that's the same way as viewing it like this, which then they're logically equivalent. And so if there's going to be a difference in it, it has to be in how the quantifiers are. Because the way you're thinking about it is the first way I was thinking about it, and then I realized that's the same as thinking about it this way, which those are for sure the same. Even then, even in the first way, does that imply something we're not intending it to apply? This and this say the exact same thing. I know, but I'm saying even in the first way. Are we, are we saying something that we not this way? Yeah. Well, this is the way the author has it. Okay. So if they're different, I'm guessing this one's right. Well, what if the author's wrong? That is possible, <laughs> too. But usually that's your last resort. That's Aquinas? <laughs> that is, pronounce it? 
Aquinas. Aquinas. Aquinas, is that right? That's how I pronounce it. Did I write a word? No, it's right. They wrote Aquinas. Okay. Aquinas. I'm just wondering if we're saying that if you don't follow Aristotle, Aquinas. you like Aquinas followers. Aquinas. No, we're saying if you follow Aristotle, Aquinas. then you like all of Aquinas' followers. I know, but look at the way we've written it. Aquinas. It says that if you don't follow Aristotle, then you like Aquinas' followers. No, it doesn't. The likes is right here. Just because this thing evaluates the truth doesn't mean anyone liked anyone. For all the Aristotle's followers and all of Aquinas' followers. Okay, if I'm thinking about it a little bit wrong. Like yeah. If X, X, all you're trying to think is, is there something that makes this true and this false? Yeah. Yes. Or this true and this false? No. And it's not going to be in how the AX, the QY, and the XLY come out. It's not going to be those because this is the same as this. And so any justification we have for how they're different has to come somehow come from the placement of the quantifiers. Well, if, if you were to picture for all y as being there exists a y, then I guess it kind of does matter. Like if you read through the two of them, then it then there's a difference because of how you placed it. But there's not a difference if they're both for all. Four. So maybe the top one is the better one because of that. For any first person you choose. If they're Aristotle's follower, then for any second person you choose. It's saying if that, then there, there exists, and then the bottom one is for all, that there exists. There's no if. There's no there exists. I'm, I'm just saying if you were to picture the second quantifier as a there exists, because we're just looking at the quantifier and seeing if the placement matters. I don't know. That was just my reasoning to oh, the I top see. one's better because I see what you're thinking. It works about. no matter what the quantifier. If we are. rewrite that in terms of an That's existential, right. would we see something? Then, then there's a difference, at least. We could write out kind of the way that you showed us how to do it. Way for back. all x, if you're Aristotle's follower, then it is not the case that there exists a y such that there are Aquinas' follower. You could try writing out our end statement, what we want to say at the very end. And For all x, it, it, easier. it is not the case that there exists a y such that not that thing. It's almost like wrapping. Uh, no, it's going to be the same. It's the same stuff. So. Because this one's going to end up saying, for all there exists, such that da 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 da. Ah. The if statement in between them is. A little bit confusing to me. Yeah. Then you pull out a quantifier. You could. Could you not have pulled out the AY? I cannot the... see how those things are different. And now I kind of want to go play with it by plugging in existential quantifiers and see if I can get something to come out. They're not different. You could write this in code in both cases and then return the exact same result. You're literally just wrapping the, the for all Y on the first one, you're wrapping it in an if statement. If X is Aristotle's follower, then do this loop. The, and the bottom one is just 4H, 4H, then do your logic. Where the other one is you're just wrapping your logic in an if statement. It shouldn't matter where you I are. like what your intuition is saying. Yeah, why is it and I think it's valid. I can't think why it wouldn't be. And the, the bottom one's actually more inefficient, technically, if you, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> if you're looping over objects. That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> Why would you bother looping over the Y if he's not even Aquinas' follower? It <laughs> just has to be. Right. If you're Aristotle's follower and you're Aquinas' follower, of course, Aristotle's follower. I can't see how there's a difference. Yeah, I so I don't know how Max would tell me. If you were to put your AY on, on that first one, your for all Y at the beginning, it wouldn't change the logic of that line. If you said for all x and for all Let's y. Let's see what you're saying. So you're saying we write for all x, for all y, ax implies qy implies xly. So this? Yeah, that, that's the same statement, right? Except for ax, ay. <laughs> I'm sorry. For all x, for all y, if x is Aristotle's follower, then, if y is Aquinas' follower, then Aristotle's follower, yeah. Those are the oh, same. well, that. And yeah. so, and then that's the, you use your conditional premise thing to do that second line. They're, they're logically equivalent, right? So that's the same as that. I agree. 
this being the same as that, I agree that seems like they're the same. I don't know the rule that says we could say they're the same. How would it change it? If you say I don't know. Lines, I don't think it does change it. If you had a statement that said, uh, for example, for all x, <coughs> ax, that doesn't change anything when you say for all x or all y, ax. I, I agree with you. I don't think they're different. But I think we're largely just relying on our intuition for that. I, I can't think of a rule that justifies it. I just think if we tried to, we could prove from this, prove that, and from that, prove that. Is there a way, is there a rule that allows you to distribute that quantifier to both parts of that? See, I don't think so. And that's what I was trying to think back to. They've got to be the same. I think that they got to be the same too. But there they might not be any be rule same. for it, and it might be the only way to actually make that judgment is to prove it. Like, I think that one's intuitive enough that we can see it. I bet you could prove it. It can't be that hard. I bet we could prove it, too. I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll keep it that way since you offered it. Um, do it the hard way. I think it's only a little bit easier because, well, maybe not. Hard way, but it doesn't matter. Either way works. All right. We'll do it your way. You don't know. I think we'll do the specification. The only reason I think there might be an advantage is we could do specification on the x first, then the y, instead of doing them both in one go. But I don't think it matters. I think we'll be fine either way. Let's just crank it out. For all x, for all y, if you're Aquinas' follower and, or if you're Aristotle's follower and y is Aquinas' follower, then x likes y, right? Yeah. True. Okay. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Premise two. None of Aristotle's followers like idealists. For all there does not exist. <laughs> there does not exist. <laughs> I think we want to do for all exists. X and for all Y. Again. Uh, I think it's for yeah. all X. Yeah, for all X. Oh, for all C. For all Y? Again is what you said. For all X and for all Y. Well, why is it? No. We can do um, A applies to X and I, to I know why the author wrote it the way he did. And it makes sense. We're going to need it that way. Okay. okay. Can you not do it this way or is it just harder? Uh, I guess we can. It's just we don't have the rule. We don't have the rules that make that easy for us. Okay. I think you're just getting the on it. We'll keep that written up and then we'll write it the other way and then I think you'll understand why. I think the author wrote it that way. Okay. So he said, for all x, Aristotle's follower applying to x implies that for all y, if Aquinas is follower, then x likes y, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the way the author is going to write it. Now the second one, the way the author would write it, is for all x, if Aristotle's follower applies to x, then for all y, what was it? Uh, if being an idealist applies to y, then not x likes y, right? Yeah. Okay. Aristotle's followers do not like idealists. Yeah. Okay. So for all x, if x is Aristotle's follower, then for all y, if they're an idealist, it is not the case that x likes y. Doesn't that say if you're not Aristotle's follower, you like idealists? No. Which? If you're Aristotle's follower, then if someone's an idealist, you do not like them. This is, we like Aquinas' followers, we do not like idealists. All right, and then three, this is the whole reason why, and I think you'll see it now. What's our third one? None of the Aristotle's followers are idealists. Like, oh wait, do we have to specify? I missed a premise! Did, Did I really skip a whole premise? Did you miss the premise? Yes. The premise I'm missing is Aristotle has followers. Oh, um, yeah. Because your set can't be empty. Is that right? Because your domain can't be empty. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. Moreover, Aristotle does have followers. Therefore, none of Aquinas' followers are 
Idealis. Okay, math number three. So you say there exists x where ax. And so you see we're going to get that ax, and now the ax being true is going to give us these things. And that's why it's convenient to have it written that way. Yeah. Rather than this way, because the ax being true doesn't give you anything to infer from this. Whereas if ax is true, you're able to infer this. So that's where it comes from. All right, four. Now what are we going to do? Specify. Yeah, we're going to specify the x here. We're going to say then John Doe is a follower of Aristotle. OK. Then what? Huh? Specify one and two. So then we can say for all y, if being Aquinas' follower applies to y, then beta likes y. Right? And for all y, if being an idealist applies to y, then it is not the case that beta likes y. Can you specify again? And then we specify again on these, right? Yeah. And we can just plug in the y's, so that would just give us this. Okay. So then I know that's conditional. Term. That's the case. Then for an arbitrary y. Are those the same y? No. Funny. <laughs> no. Then for some arbitrary x that we use, we can say z. Yeah, there then for some arbitrary z, if it's Aquinas' follower, yeah. then beta like z. And for some arbitrary z, if it's I, z. For some arbitrary z, if it's an idealist, z, z, then z. not beta like z. likes the idealist. Do you, did you want those both to be z? Do you yes. Z and I, z? Yes. Because they're very linear. For any arbitrary thing, if it's Aquinas' follower, beta likes them. And for that same arbitrary thing, if it's an idealist, beta does, or yeah, beta does not like them. Okay. Okay. Now what can we do? Do the contrapositive of this. Do the contrapositive of this, which would be not this implies not this. Right. So beta likes z. So we'll write that over here. This is saying the same thing as beta like z implies not i z. So then we combine this with this. And so 9 is QZ implies beta likes Z. If you're Aquinas's, then beta likes you. Wait a minute. We already had that on my separate. Then not IZ. Oh, then not IZ. Then Thank not you. Idealist. QZ gives us not IZ. Ta da. And then. Oh, then you got to generalize. Did I do it backwards? None of Aquinas follows, and you did none of idealists. No, you did that right sign backwards. Therefore, so you would switch it. Now, the universal the specification again. for all z, if you're Aquinas' follower, then you are not an idealist. Or to say it the way that we have it, not qz implies iz. Is that right? Or, or is that. No, because it's not. Change? None, look, none of Aquinas' followers are idealists. Okay. That's the same thing as for all z, okay. if you're a follower of Aquinas, you're not an idealist. Yep. Yep. Every one of his followers aren't an idealist. I think that works. We can see what his last line was. For all y, qy implies not i, y. We just need to step y. Yep, same last line. Cool. Okay, there's the thinking there. All right, call it there. Class, same time next week. Stick with Tuesdays. Can we do Mondays? You got to go vote. I did vote. Oh.